Hello, everyone. Bonjour. Uh, I'm Natalie Bull, Executive Director of the National Trust for Canada. It's my pleasure to welcome you to Shovel Ready Heritage Boot Camp. And again, we'll just ask you if you're willing to um, let us know in the chat box uh, who you are and where you're calling in from. We're very pleased to have you with us today. Um, before we begin, let's acknowledge Indigenous people's longstanding presence and territory in the places that we all call home. I'm grateful to be here in New Brunswick on the unceded traditional territory of the Wulistoge people. Uh, and I know that we're all calling in from different places, but we can certainly acknowledge uh, the Indigenous peoples of all of the lands where we collectively find ourselves today. And it's, it's really just one small way that we can express our commitment to reconciliation as a country. I'd like to just take a moment and tell you about the National Trust for Canada. Our objective as an organization is to provide game-changing support that will help keep useful older buildings out of landfill and that will increase the sustainability and the impact of the, the wonderful places that tell the story of Canada. And we're, we're really committed to helping individuals and groups and communities protect the character of the places that they call home. So one of the ways that we do that is through sharing resources, uh, through web webinars like these, and through the, the leadership that we uh, provide for the sector, our, our work in advocacy. And so today's session, Shovel Ready Heritage Boot Camp, is, is really connected to both of those, of, of those goals that we hold as an organization. And it, it comes out of the Shovel Ready Heritage campaign that we launched, I think at the beginning of the pandemic, um, in the course of a number of gatherings, we brought the sector together to talk about the, what sort of response we should be mounting uh, collectively. And, and we agreed that the most powerful thing we could do is really tell our governments about the role that heritage places can play in, in being part of a, of a powerful economic recovery for our country. We know that investing in, in heritage places creates green jobs, uh, can benefit tourism, improve quality of life, and, and be a, a huge boost to the economy. So collectively, we came together and wrote to five federal ministers, um, recommending that at least $200 million in stimulus funding <clears throat> be, be set aside for heritage places. Uh, and then I think the next thing we decided is, okay, we have to back up that claim. We have to show that there are great heritage projects out there that could benefit from stimulus funding or infrastructure funding. So collectively, we, we crowdsourced an incredible list uh, for, the, for the first time, we now have a list of about $400 million worth of work that if it were uh, to take place at Heritage Projects would create thousands of, of green jobs and really help support Canada's economic recovery. But, but being on that list is not about being funded. And, and uh, as much as we wish we could fund all those projects on the list, we really all have a lot of work to do as a sector. And we'll talk a bit more about that um, at the end of the call. But uh, what we learned in the process of getting to know uh, about infrastructure funding and what might be possible, we, we really learned how critical it is for uh, F the efforts to secure funding to really be focused at the local and the provincial level. Uh, and we, I think we also already knew that, that successful projects typically benefit from multiple funding sources and certainly not just from government funding. So that brings us to the session that we're hosting today. It's really designed for the people and the groups who need funding to make their shovel-ready heritage projects a reality. And we're really um, excited today to learn from the, the leaders of two successful heritage projects. Uh, we'll, we'll have access to their practical advice on selling your project to champions and elected officials, accessing funding, attracting donors, and more. Um, today, we'll also feature some of the resources that are available from the National Trust. And then finally, we'll check in on what's happening federally and talk a bit more about our, our advocacy as a sector. Um, we, re we really want today's session to be an informal conversation. So we're really encouraging everyone to use the, the chat function. And I see lots of great uh, comments from people weighing in from all across the country. Uh, use the Q&A. If you, if you could focus your questions in the Q&A uh, and make sure that, that, that comments and questions are directed to all all attendees, um, we'll do our best to, to bring those into the conversation and respond to them. N'hésitez pas de poser des questions soit en français, soit en anglais, and we'll do our best to respond. Uh, and we will try and keep today's session to no more than an hour and 15 minutes. So we'll, I'll be watching the clock a bit, but we'll, uh, we'll try and wrap up for sure um, within, an, within an hour and 15 minutes of our start time. And now without further ado, I'd like to introduce our, our panel today. 
we have Aggie Rose Redden, who is the Vice Chair of the Glen Allerdale Heritage Trust, uh, coming to us from PEI to talk about the extraordinary work that, uh, that her group did to acquire an amazing property and they're now in the process of developing it. We also have Tara Lee Heslip, um, who's with us from Saskatchewan. She is the chair of the Indian Head Theatre and Community Arts Incorporated, and she's going to tell us how her community, uh, with the leadership of this group, took uh, an at-risk theatre and turned it into an incredible community asset. And it's, it's exciting to me to know that the Trust had very early contact with both of these projects and both of these people, uh, when, when really they were at the the, the starting point of this work. So it's incredibly gratifying to see the great success that they both have and it's, it's a pleasure to share it here. We also have our, our third um, special guest That's panelist hot. is Gil Barrows, who many of you know from uh, past sessions with the National Trust. He's been advising us on our government relations work for a few years now. Uh, and we have Alison Faulkner, who is the Trust Director of Partnerships and Philanthropy. <laughs> Uh, who many of you may know from, from her participation in many Regeneration Works webinars. So uh, we're, we're all going to take this session quite informally. We'll jump in and inter interrupt each other and make sure that we don't forget things that we want to cover. Uh, and I'll, I encourage all of you to do the same, to use that uh, Q&A box and the chat function uh, liberally. So I want to thank our panelists uh, for preparing videos in advance that we shared with all of you uh, yesterday, I believe. And uh, maybe just go ahead to the next slide, Emily. Uh, we were um, really, really um, excited to be able to share their stories in a bit more detail. So it means we can use our time more effectively today to zero in specifically on the successes that they've had in securing funding and working with partners. Uh, but if you, if you enjoyed their videos, why don't you send us a comment in the chat box uh, and you'll receive them again with the recording of this session that we'll be sending out within 24 hours. So now without further ado, let's jump into our first success story, Glenn Allerdale with Aggie Rose Redden. And I'll turn it over to you, Aggie, to, to give us the high points. Thank you, Natalie. Uh, hi, everyone. Um, welcome from glorious PEI. <laughs> nice, nice September day. Um, I'm hoping that you will have watched the video. And uh, if not, if you've not already seen it, that you'll do that afterwards. So I'm going to uh, be very quickly uh, skip over the introduction stuff, um, other than to say that uh, I'm vice chair with the, the trust. We are a 10 member uh, volunteer board. Um, we started down this trail in 2012 and it was 2018 that we were finally able to close on the purchase of the Glen Allerdale estate. Uh, it's about 530 acres of land. Um, and the Glen Allerdale House, the Glen Allerdale School are uh, important elements uh, to that. And that's what we are uh, focused on right now, actually, is moving forward um, to have those, uh, uh, the conservation of the house and the rehab of the school done in advance of the uh, 2022, which is the 250th uh, anniversary of the arrival of the Glen Allerdale settlers to Conservative Island. Um, so to, to get right to the meat of it, <laughs> Natalie sent us out our list of questions to answer, which is much appreciated. Um, on the key, key lessons learned, um, I think my comment would be the first thing that I learned is that sometimes being naive is a good thing. Because if I had known back in 2012 just how much of my life and the lives of everybody else involved in this project were going to um, be consumed by it and how long it would take before we could get to the point where we're at now. I'm not sure if I would have gone down the road, um, but it's good. It's all good. Um, we also were naive in not realizing uh, just relative to where people um, give their donated uh, uh, contributions. Um, heritage and culture is, is uh, quite far down on the list and, and it I think creates special challenges for any of us who are involved in trying to do the fundraising. Um, to talking about the relationships and the connections, um, we have an advantage here on the island and I think anywhere in the Maritimes really, where we are very closely connected to our politicians. Um, so that makes life a lot easier for us. On the other hand, um, 
and a frustration that we certainly have had is that on the fundraising end of things, it makes it very difficult um, on the community level because we have very limited number of uh, foundations and larger um, uh, established uh, trusts that we can apply um, to for assistance on a provincial level. Um, we were able to purchase the estate with the assistance of the Cultural Spaces Fund of Canadian Heritage. And we are now um, uh, waiting on uh, word about our um, legacy application uh, that we have submitted uh, to help with the uh, conservation and re uh, rehabbing of the buildings. Um, <laughs> We, we found when we started that the, the first thing that became obvious was no one knew what Glenaladale was, where it was, what it was about. And in order to persuade people to help us out with it, we really had to spend an extraordinary amount of time um, just educating uh, people ab about the, the property. Um, the big advantage that we had, at least in our case, was that if we could get the people to come to the property, it was a very easy sales pitch. Um, it's just so obvious um, what the property and the estate has to offer that uh, it really made it uh, very pleasant on that end of things. But it was an incredible amount of time that we spent uh, on that end of it. Um, something else that I uh, came to realize was that it's, um, don't get discouraged if people don't get it. And if people don't get it, don't waste your time trying to persuade them to get it. Uh, at least that was our experience. You know, it was either um, they understood what we were trying to do and uh, supported it, or it was they didn't really understand and there was no way in God's green earth that they were ever gonna understand. <laughs> so that was it something that took us a little uh, a while to kind of just, okay, um, we've done our best, let it go and move on. Um, the other uh, big challenge um, that uh, kind of I wish I had known <laughs> was the importance of timing. Um, when we started, we had a provincial government that got it and a federal government that didn't get it. Then a few years later, we had the federal government that got it and our provincial government didn't get it. And we needed um, both to be in sync. And um, we now thankfully have a provincial government that gets it as I, I personally feel the federal government does as well. So that's been a big help. Um, so I, I think at this point, I would say that we're very um, pleased with the amount of government uh, support we're getting. Um, but the challenge really is on the um, larger scale philanthropic um, parts of the of the project. Um, so, um, anything else, Natalie, that you think I should <laughs> mention at this point? I'm really looking forward to people's questions. Good, you know, that's, that's great, Aggie Rose. And I think Gil is going to come on next, and he may he may have some questions for you. And I would encourage you to have a bit of a conversation about the the government relations aspect of the project. And I, I know from having been there with you early on in the project, uh, I was really impressed with the relationships you had built and the sort of um, like, not just a, a formal meeting for an ask, but, but also having elected officials there at the site for social events and, and learning opportunities. Yeah, it really um, is, was critical for us. There's no question about that. Um, it, some of that is just a very natural result of being um, in a small place. Um, we know these people, so it's no big deal. But the other side of it is from their perspective, it really becomes important for them to show up to things too, because if they don't show up, um, they hear about it. <laughs> Great, so maybe why don't we hand it over to Gil and we'll also, there, there, is, a, there is a question I might just interject now uh, from a project proponent uh, asking about accessing funding. Um, and so I, I just want to say again that the, the purpose of this session is because unfortunately we don't have $200 million uh, in our shovel ready fund. We're, we're advocating to the federal government that 
that substantial funding needs to be earmarked for heritage projects. Uh, but, but we all have lots of work to do. Um, and, there, and there's also lots of opportunity with existing infrastructure funding uh, that, that, that um, if, if, if we become uh, more politically savvy, I think we will be able to do a better job of accessing. So again, just clarifying that um, it's great to have your project on our list of shovel ready heritage projects because it helps us substantiate the ask to government. Uh, but, but again, we, we all have work to do to find the funding for these projects and we're, we're talking about that here today. So Gil, over to you, why don't you um, share some insights um, from related to Aggie's story and beyond about the importance of government relations in, in funding heritage projects. Yeah, thanks Natalie. Well, obviously government relations is just a small slice of what needs to be done. You can see in the, the videos from from Tara Lee and, and Aggie Rose that it's a very complicated thing, but my focus in the video that I've done is for government relations and trying to help people to understand the role that they can play with the government. Uh, I would just say at the outset, this is a time of great opportunity. The federal government has dished out literally billions and billions of dollars for infrastructure. So if you can somehow link your project to that, then uh, you'll, be, uh, you'll, you'll have a leg up, there's no doubt about it. And I would say that in regard to the money that's being spent on infrastructure, that you should move now because the government uh, in the COVID environment has spent an enormous amount of money and the chickens will come home to roost soon. That some things are going to be cut and some things are going to be delayed. Now that hasn't happened yet, but it's just keeping in mind that it's best to move now than to wait for uh, the bond rating agencies to tell the governments that they better tune up their, clean up their act. Uh, one of the things that uh, we think is, that I think is very important is that in your government relations, planning is the number one thing setting out your objective and being clear and being critical of, of it and seeing if it's achievable within a reasonable time frame is really, really important. You can save yourself a whole lot of grief if you get an objective that's achievable. I've had potential clients come to me in my capacity as a consultant and I've had to tell them, look, it can't be done in the time you want. And it pained me to give up the business and somebody else got the business, but the fact is the, uh, the group never met its objective. So the planning is, is really, really important. Uh, the other part of planning is trying to leverage government's agendas. Now, whether it's a municipal government or a provincial government or a federal government, if you can get onto their agenda somehow, that'll really help. And I think that at all three levels of government, the biggest thing right now on their agenda is jobs. And if your project could generate 100 jobs, 10, jo 10 jobs, whatever, even if it's just 10 jobs, that's potentially 10 families. And that's, that's good news to uh, governments at all levels, as I say. The other thing that's on many government's agendas, particularly the federal government's agenda, is uh, in environment issues. And, you know, we know that the, uh, the existing building is the greenest building, rather than tearing it down and hauling it out to the uh, landfill, restoring business is the, the way to go. And so if you can link to the environmental agenda of the governments, great. Um, tourism is a big thing as another way you made it may have to link to the government's agenda because we know that tourists uh, at heritage sites tend to be older and tend to spend more money uh, when they're touring around. So that means more jobs in restaurants, more jobs in hotels. So local tourism could be big. And we know on the agenda of a lot of governments, uh, indigenous issues are, are really important. Now, I don't if you can leverage indigenous issues, great. I wouldn't try to appropriate an indigenous issue, but I think if you can uh, cooperate with indigenous groups, uh, you, you may have a leg up. So in summary, 
try to link to whatever government's agenda you can. And I've just given you some examples, but you'll know better at the local level or at the provincial level what, what to try and leverage. Uh, I also say in the video some advice about meeting with government people. And this applies again to all three levels of government. The biggest thing is the uh, time constraint that they face. In a typical meeting with an elected official, you've got 30 minutes. <laughs> and in the 30 minutes, you've got five minutes for chit chat, you've got 10 minutes to present, <coughs> excuse me, and then 10 minutes to listen. And this is really important, listen and have dialogue. And then five minutes to wrap up, make your ask and wrap up. So you can see in your 10 minute presentation, <coughs> excuse me, you've got uh, a lot of ground to cover. So if you're doing, for instance, a PowerPoint presentation, you can't do really more than five slides. If, uh, if you're doing a brief, it has to be very brief. And the important thing is that people aren't gonna carry around your brief or your PowerPoint presentation with them. They have to get the message in their head. If you want uh, an elected official to go talk to a minister on your behalf, that person has to remember they're not carrying their brief around with you, with them. They, they need to have the clear message in their head and the clear ask. And keep it simple. Keep the graphics very simple. If you're using graphics, keep the words very simple and very clear and make a very clear ask. And then the follow-up is extremely important. You need to find out at the end of the meeting, okay, what do you do next? What do we do next? And, and don't let it slide, be persistent. Um, I'll just give a, a final thought about heritage. And I'm sure that all of you know that heritage often isn't a very high priority in government's agendas. But what you've got, I, I, I'm just looking at the number of participants here. <clears throat> We've got 99 people on this call. And we've had these calls regularly with lots of people calling in. So there are people out there. Uh, we got uh, a petition to the House of Commons, about 30,000 signatures. So it's probably, probably your biggest strength is the numbers. If you can work together, that can have much more influence than, uh, than pure money. And uh, I think, you know, supporting what the National Trust is doing is, uh, you know, obviously they're providing the tools and the advice for you to work, but as you support the National Trust, the National Trust can support you. Is that it, it's a synergy where locally and nationally we're working together. Uh, <laughs> excuse me, Natalie, did you want me to say something about the sort of milestones that uh, are coming up that people should watch for? Well, maybe we'll talk about that at the end, Gil. Okay. We'll, we'll move into the federal mode and uh, for now focus on projects. And there is a great question. <clears throat> Sarah is asking about advice for keeping government officials at all levels engaged in the project. So monthly emails, uh, on-site visits are hard right now. So uh, Gil or Aggie, uh, if you'd like to, you have any thoughts in answering that question? From our end, um, it was not a, really a challenge because, as I said, we were very successful in getting them to come out for the site visits. And even now, if we needed to, we are blessed to be on PEI because we have no community spread yet. Um, but other than that, um, it was uh, occasional phone calls, really. Um, that's what made the difference for us. Um, it's, it is important um, that you, you keep, keep that connection going. Um, and uh, I appreciated what, what Gil was saying about their agendas. Um, and I would take that down to a, a personal level. If you find the politician or the bureaucrat that is supportive, um, they would, I would suggest they'd be the key people to stay in close contact with because they can then um, carry the message forward. If they get excited about the project, then you can be sure that they will uh, do whatever they, they can to, to help them be my, my take on it. Thanks, Aggie Rose. I would just add that uh, persistence is really important. And I, 
I think you can see from the videos on the, the two other projects that it's, it's not an easy job. You have to stick with it. And, you, and I guess the question was, you know, what are the best ways? I think the best way is, is the personal connection, but you obviously can't personally connect with 100 people all the same time. So people do different things. Uh, social media is becoming really important for that, just to keep people aware. I, I also like uh, sort of personal mailing lists, <coughs> excuse me, where uh, you send out regular updates to people and directly, and if you can personalize it, that's great. And then um, if you can just, in the mainstream media, uh, a story on the front page of a local paper is, is worth an awful lot to keep people engaged and aware. Great, thanks so much. Uh, so don't hesitate, Aggie Roast. Uh, I think we're now going to hand things over to Alison Faulkner uh, to, to uh, provide some thoughts about uh, f funding projects and she may have some specific questions for you about the funds that you tapped into. So over to you, Alison. Sure, hi everyone, can you hear me? Yep. Great. Um, I thought I would touch on a couple of points and then maybe refer to some of the resources that the National Trust has to support. Um, both, both Aggie Rose and Gill mentioned the fact that heritage and culture might be far down on the list. And that's something that we deal with a lot when we work with groups through our Launchpad coaching or the kinds of questions we get when we do Regeneration Works webinars. And I think I can't underscore that point enough about thinking outside the box in terms of what your community impact is as a project. So I, I think we tend to think about, start our project with the lens of heritage and, and we have this sort of narrow um, view, but if you really think about the community impact, um, it can link to federal priorities as you mentioned, Gil, but it, it could also be youth engagement or it could be that your project uh, fits the bill for accessibility funding, or uh, it could be educational. So really think about all of the ways that you are having an impact on the community. And heritage might be one, but there might be all kinds of other funding sources that suddenly uh, you're eligible for that you wouldn't have been if you were only thinking about the history and heritage of the site. Um, the other thought that I wanted to add here too was to remind everyone that there certainly are federal funding envelopes and provincial and municipal funding envelopes to be aware of. Uh, Aggie, Aggie Rose, you mentioned the Canada Cultural Spaces Fund uh, and the Legacy Fund. And of course, at the federal level, there's also the National Cost Sharing Program for Heritage Places. Um, but also think about all of the foundations. There's an enormous network of community foundations out there. There are family foundations. Uh, there are fa corporate foundations. Uh, so there are lots of other ways as well to fund, fund your projects. I'll maybe get Emily to click forward to the next slide. Um, three resources that the National Trust has that um, are relevant to those who are trying to identify potential funders uh, are, are the first two I'll mention are a previously recorded webinar on demand on finding and securing grants for your heritage project, as well as a tip sheet on uh, grant funding. Both of those can be found at our regenerationworks.ca website and are useful if you're trying to think through who are your funders and um, also what lens is the, are the funders looking at your project from. And then the last, I think, that is important is the Find Funding Tool, if you haven't already explored it. So it will list uh, the national funding sources we just talked about and links through to the websites, uh, but also uh, funding sources at the provincial and municipal level. Um, we try to make it as comprehensive as we can, but it's certainly not an exhaustive list. So if you're there and you think there's something missing, uh, we appreciate that that is a crowdsourced resource. <laughs> so we, we appreciate your thoughts if you think something is uh, missing. But I had a question for Aggie Rose, um, knowing your project a little bit and having listened to your, um, your video, you talked about two federal funds that require matching funds. 
And I wondered for the education of everybody on the line, if you could talk a little bit about how you found those matching funds, um, how you mobilized that support to match the federal funding. Um, in the case of the purchase, uh, we were able to persuade our previous provincial government um, to provide a mortgage, or I should say they were prepared to give us a mortgage. Um, it was not the ask that we had approached them with, but it was um, what was being offered. And um, we felt at the time that was appropriate thing to do because we knew that another provincial election was coming soon and that it, there may be possibilities for changing that arrangement. And um, I guess I can say that we are in um, current negotiations and anticipate a positive announcement um, in the not too distant future on that one. Um, so uh, to actually purchase the property, um, we ended up not an ideal situation, um, but uh, things change. Um, and if you have to do what you have to do, then just keep in mind that things do change when it comes to politics. Um, on the uh, current application, um, we, we um, will be um, uh, having to do, continue uh, to do our fundraising on a personal and, and uh, corporate and, and foundation level. Um, we do have the one um, source for um, uh, larger scale, well, me medium scale, um, uh, donations through the Community Foundation of PEI. And I was negligent in not mentioning our partnership with them because they have been <laughs> very, very supportive of us right from the get-go. Um, those tend to be small funds, but we've been successful in um, receiving contributions from several of the small funds and that kind of adds up. Um, so that's, that's been a big help as well. And our provincial Department of Rural Development, as, as you, you mentioned there, Allison, about thinking outside the box, um, it's rural development. That's the core of what we are doing. It's, it, yes, it's heritage, but it's rural development. Mm -hmm. and, um, they have been very supportive of us, and, and I think that we can take some credit um, in opening their eyes as to exactly what rural development can involve. Um, because when, before we had our ask, it was, you were limited to $25,000, which was basically enough to put a new roof on a community hall. Um, now it's $100,000 a year, and we can go back um, for more every year. So um, that's how we hope to be able to pull it all together with, uh, in combination with Legacy. Thanks, Aggie Rose. And I can see my colleague Rob is sharing some of those links that I talked about earlier in uh, the chat box. And I should also say that uh, don't feel like you have to furiously write everything down in the follow-up email. We'll include any links that we mentioned today. Natalie, was there anything else you wanted us to touch on before we move on to fundraising and talk to Tara Lee? I might just note, note that you knew Bumbaru from Heritage Montréal made a comment about um, the Canadian Heritage Funding, the Cultural Spaces Funding, and Legacy Funding, that we, we, we need to uh, do a good job of getting the word out about how valuable that funding is to our sector. There, there's very little heritage-specific funding available. So when, when there is uh, funding like that, well, in, in fact, Cultural Spaces isn't specific for heritage buildings, but many historic places have been able to take advantage of it. Uh, and so that, that's something we can do is to, to share those uh, case studies. And I think too, something that uh, Aggie Rose mentioned in her video, she mentioned saying thank you. Uh, and I, I think that's important, both, both with government funding and our work with elected officials. We, we, we do a good job of asking sometimes, but we don't always remember to say thank you when things come through. So I think that's, that's an important point to, uh, to highlight as well. Great. If, if there aren't any other questions about grants, that's actually a terrific segue, Natalie, to Tara Lee's presentation, because she's going to be talking a lot about donors and thanking, they do such a wonderful job of thanking their corporate sponsors and their donors. So 
uh, Tara, you might have gotten to know Tara Lee a little bit in her video. I hope you watched her wonderful um, video and got to see their beautiful grand theater in Indian Head, Saskatchewan. Tara Lee is the chair of the board. And as Natalie mentioned earlier on today, we got to know Tara early on, probably about a decade ago, when they were one of four of the first Main Street Saskatchewan program demonstration projects. And I think that the theater was uh, sort of apple in Tara Lee's eye um, during that time and it was born out of that program. And we also worked uh, Tara Lee with your colleagues through our Launchpad coaching program and we worked Daggy Rose with your colleagues as well, you and your colleagues, um, through our Launchpad coaching program. We'll talk a little bit about um, that donor funded program that the National Trust runs at the end of the program. So I'm gonna pass it over to you Tara Lee. Thank you so much. So welcome from Saskatchewan. I'm uh, here in Treaty 4 territory, which is the traditional territory of the Cree Nakoda, Lakota, Nakoda and Soto people, as well as the homeland of the Métis. And we love where we're at. Uh, as Allison mentioned, the Grand Theatre really did stem out of the Main Street project, at which time I was the Main Street coordinator in our community. And we became aware that we were at great risk of losing this building and venue within our community, which was at the time operating as a full-time movie theater. It was built in 1904 as an opera house and in later years transitioned over to a movie theater when fixed seating was required and was always privately owned up until 2014, when as a community, we created a not-for-profit organization and raised funds to purchase the building and work on preserving it, which was an enormous task. So I think I'm going to talk a little bit about what we've accomplished from an organizational standpoint, from a building preservation standpoint, and then go into a little bit about our funding model, because we really did start from scratch. So in 2014, besides creating the organization, we had to learn how to run a business. So we do operate a full-time movie theater currently, but we also expanded it into a cultural center for the region, offering a lot of various art and cultural programming throughout the year as well. And in amongst this, of course, we're, we developed a strategic plan finally last year where we need an updated business plan. Uh, we've been very blessed and feel everybody needs to look at partnerships, whether it's at a national or provincial level, as well as regional and local. So as mentioned, National Trust was a huge part of our early days in mentoring us and helping guide us uh, through the forest. And we also have terrific provincial organizations such as SAS Heritage and the Heritage SAS Foundation, which introduced us and led us to have a greater understanding of intangible cultural heritage and telling our story and the value of that. And then through other arts and cultural organizations such as Commonweal, we've been able to really delve into uh, connecting at a local level through the arts, anti-racism and TRC and incorporating TRC work as well within our programming. Uh, our local museum as well is tremendous and we've been able to partner with them on uh, creating a Métis Knowledge Keepers documentary and things along that line too. So in 2014, we bought the building. Immediately, we needed to upgrade that projector that was a 35 mil system at the time, as well as sound and lighting. We also were able to partner with our local community theater group at this time who financially contributed to the upgrade of the lighting system to assist with their productions as well. We repointed the exterior. Uh, we completely uh, worked on the foundation so it is now secure and our entire roof had to be rebuilt and thankfully we were able to retain the tin ceiling throughout the building but the entire structure of the roof was rebuilt from scratch. We've done full electrical upgrades to the building. And in the last couple of years, now that the building's secure, we've done, a, I can't remember if it was a four or a 5D scan of the building that allowed us to create the as-built drawings and work with 
architects to create some conceptual drawings for a four phase project moving forward that will enable us to expand our programming and all the offerings that we will be able to make in the community. And of course, dealing with a heritage building that's a little complex that required uh, contracting a code consultant too at the tune of $20,000. But now at least we're at a phase that we, we feel pretty positive that uh, we can move forward and start having those conversations with government and other funders as well. So from a funding standpoint, and Emily, you could probably switch the slide here to some of our initial donors. If you watch the video we, I spoke about in the early days, literally phoning everybody in the phone book. And because we weren't 100% sure if we could save this building, if we could come up with the funds to purchase the building and do the upgrades required. So we phoned everybody and came up with enough pledges that we knew we could move forward. And so the movie reels and the plaques on the backs of the seats were part of that original donor campaign. And I think I really appreciated uh, listening to Aggie Rose's video as well as her talk and that discussion about telling the stories and how important that was and the correlation that we both have that connection in our place and how important that was. And I think we felt the same in those early days. We felt kind of like a bunch of idealistic teenagers that were taking on this insane project. And I'm sure a lot of people thought we were crazy until we actually managed to pull it off and then more people bought in. Um, so a big part of the success from our funding model is that it is quite diverse. As I mentioned, we do run a business uh, from the movie side. We run a lot of events. So uh, about six times a year, we will have uh, live performances that are music based. And then we also have about three or four theater productions a year in amongst the movies. And as mentioned, a lot of different programming. So for example, and some of the programming we do isn't always necessarily taking place in our venue. So for example, we partnered with Commonweal Community Arts and they're a provincial entity. And we're able to bring in a indigenous artist and in resident who worked on a bridging project between our local high school and Nakoroid, which is the First Nation high school that are neighbors to us. And they worked on buffalo hide tanning and had a, a wonderful uh, project together where the kids from our high school went out to Kajikin First Nation and spent a couple of days working with them side by side and learning stories of the origins of this place and all of the awful and wonderful things that have happened over the years. So we've been able to participate and create really incredible opportunities that way, which I think gains us additional buy-in to our project. As I mentioned, that face-to-face -face is essential. If we can get people into the building, tell the story, do a tour of the building. The ghost stories are really popular for our space. Uh, we do have quite a few spirits. They're all happy and settled. We did have one that we had to get rid of in the early days, <laughs> but that's a whole nother topic. Uh, and we do try really, really hard to ensure that we're always thanking and making people aware of our donors and sponsors. We have incredible corporate sponsorship to assist with our live events as well as with building upgrades. So social media is probably our number one tool that we utilize. And uh, for example, we do thankful Thursdays. So every Thursday we do a social media post that we thank a sponsor and tell a little bit about their business and a bit about the impact that their contribution is having on the Grand Theatre. And we are very lucky that we do have this venue to engage people. So whether it's youth or seniors, uh, you know, it's hard to define a demographic for our building because our demographic really is everybody, which makes it also additionally challenging how you reach out to everybody and give them the opportunity to participate. 
And I think that's, that's actually an early lesson I learned. I ran into somebody in the street in those early days and they commented to me that they never received a phone call and they were still waiting for somebody to phone them and ask them to donate. And it's like, you can, you know, <laughs> never pass up the chance to give somebody the opportunity to participate or donate in whatever means that is. And uh, whether it's their time or uh, in the video, I mentioned the in-kind contribution of our trades. That has been such an overwhelming success for us and really key to what we have accomplished over the last few years in securing the building. I'm trying to think what else I want to say. Uh, with our sponsors, we work really hard at customizing that sponsorship. So working with those uh, businesses and corporations to define what it is that they're looking for and how we can meet each other's needs. So it's not just a package sort of sponsorship package that we put together and throw out to people. And that has been very beneficial to everybody as well. Uh, a little bit of challenges for us. We're maybe unique in a heritage building where our entire board and our committee, so we have a board of directors and then we have four operational subcommittees. Every single one of us works full time. Nobody's retired. <laughs> so that's a challenging aspect for us when it comes to actually doing some face to face meeting during business hours and things. It, means we have volunteers, you know, using holiday time, vacation time, things along that line to be able to have those conversations and make things happen. But it's also a wonderful thing as well. So I think that's kind of what I have to say, unless you have other questions for me, Allison. Thank you, Charlie. No, I, th I think you, you touched on all the points I, I was hoping you might <laughs> touch on. Um, if it's okay, Natalie, I, just, I thought I'd make a few comments on some of the things that Charlie said and how that much of what she talked about is so important in a fundraise, from a fundraising perspective. Um, thankful Thursdays. Charlie, I am in love with that. That is my new excellent example of how you can communicate with your donors and sponsors in a really easy way and make it I imagine that also makes it just, rather than something sort of special you're doing once in a while, it just, it makes it a habit, which is a really great thing when you're dealing with sponsors and donors. Well, and we, we tend to pre-program those posts in. Yeah. So some, a volunteer can sit down and enter, you know, 10 of them in a row and set the time for them to go up and then it's done. Exactly. No, that's so terrific. Um, a couple of the points that you made that I think are really important from a funding perspective and when you're trying to diversify your funding beyond just grant funding, um, which Charlie talked about, um, is that I think what you what your project demonstrates in so many projects, Aggie Rose, yours as well, is that it there really is a community that exists, that supports the project, that's bigger than just the bricks and mortar. And the building itself is larger than life. And so the reason that you, your community rose to the challenge and saved it is because of all the memories that exist in that place and how that building is so fundamentally linked to the identity of your community. And the reason why I emphasize that is that I think, especially now during a pandemic, um, we, it's just so important to keep the lines of communication with that community going and that we're always thinking about ways that we can keep those donors and those corporate sponsors engaged and that we don't, without, without uh, meaning to kind of put up the big close sign, whether that's virtually or physically, um, those are necessary, you know, taking the proper precautions is necessary, but you can keep the lines of communication with your community up. And that community that you're talking to on social media or on your website or in your newsletter are your potential next donors, right? So you want to keep the love of the building alive uh, through that time, through this time. Um, my colleague Nancy Wright and I will be talking next week, actually, on the 22nd about fundraising during a pandemic. So anyone who's interested in digging a little deeper into that um, can I hope that you'll join us then and, and as mentioned earlier, we'll share all the links with you in the follow up email. Um, the other thing that I wanted to talk about 
is also storytelling. Tara Lee, you talked about um, all of the communications that you're doing. And what I think you guys do a really great job of doing is telling stories. And, and sometimes it's a story of the theater, but sometimes it's a story of a volunteer or it's, you know, there's stories of gratitude or there's stories of community impact. And um, all of that is, is important when you're trying to um, engage a bigger community and hopefully then also attract um, and build relationships with your donors um, and your sponsors. So uh, I encourage all of you who are on the phone who have heritage places, who have heritage projects to sort of leave no stone unturned in terms of thinking about how to tell those stories and how to be thankful and, and grateful to donors. And it might be through social media as Tara Lee was mentioning, mentioning or thankful Thursdays, or it might be somewhere else in the building. I, I think that all too often in the charitable sector, nonprofit sector, we tend to think of communications and fundraising in two silos. And really they're so linked. And the opportunities around us when you start thinking about it from that lens um, are endless. And then the last point I wanted to make, which I think is really important when we're talking about capital projects, is that um, one of the things that surprises um, my colleagues and I who do the Launchpad coaching grants with community groups who are about to start a capital campaign is how often we hear that uh, the organization hasn't actually been communicating with their donors since the last capital campaign. That we, we fall into a trap of raising money during a capital campaign as a heritage organization and then stopping raising money from don donors and sponsors until we run the next capital campaign. And in between we're focused on grant funding. And I think the diversity of funding and the, the ticket to your next matching fund for your next capital campaign is, is really those, those donors and keeping them engaged in your project and that there's nothing wrong with asking donors for um, a donation every year uh, to your organization, whether you have a bricks and mortar uh, project ahead of you or not. So those are a, a few of the things I just wanted to build on what, what you said, um, talked about Tara Lee, but, um, if you haven't already, I encourage those on the line to go back and watch both Tara Lee and Aggie Rose's um, videos because there's lots of really great insights in there. Can I, I have another look? I'm just noticing a question here. What are some recommendations for recognition during COVID when you can't welcome as many volunteer sponsors and for programming or events? And of course, we ran into that too. And immediately when we had to shut our doors to regular programming, we did contact all of our sponsors and they were all you know wanting to hang in and stay with us through COVID period um, to keep people engaged we did something a little bit interesting we did uh, pandemic popcorn pop-up sales <laughs> on Friday nights where we kept people out on the street and that was a way for people to still support us and we also then ask some of our sponsors to specifically sponsor those events and recognize them. Uh, most recently, I had our presenting sponsor actually reach out an email again saying, okay, we don't want to lose our status as presenting sponsor. We know live events really aren't happening, but what can we do? Like we, we want to still be part of this. So I think just reiterating that, keeping that line of communication open is so integral right now. That's a great idea. And, and donors and sponsors love a phone call, right? Which is, I think, what you mentioned at the beginning there. There's nothing wrong with just purely picking up the phone, giving them an update on what you're doing and keeping those lines of communication open. Great. No, what, what great role models and exemplars uh, Tara Lee and Aggie Rose are, or are for all of us who are looking for funding to make a, a project that might seem impossible, uh, actually possible and incredibly successful. Uh, and Gail, too, your, uh, your in insights into government relations have been really valuable for us. So we're, we, we still have time for questions. I do see a question popping up there. Uh, do I see it? Oh, thank you. Uh, that's great. <laughs> uh, so I think we will, um, we're still open for more questions, but we will start to segue into our, our wrap up session to talk a bit about um, the bigger picture. 
So we've, we've been focusing on uh, specific projects and the, the different sources of funding strategies for accessing funding from government, from, from, uh, from gr uh, grants, donors and sponsors. Um, but but um, back to the bigger picture and this, this idea of uh, uh, the, the wall of money that Gil talks about in his video coming toward us and, and what we can do as a sector to, to better position, not just individual projects, but also the sector uh, for, for some bigger gains to, um, to put historic places on a, on a level playing field with new construction. Uh, there was a comment um, in the, I think in the chat or the Q&A about the limitations of infrastructure funding. So we certainly don't want to um, expect that we will put all our eggs in that basket, um, but, the, but there may be ways that we can influence the terms and conditions for, the, for that kind of funding that is coming to make sure that it, it is as, as relevant and accessible for as many kinds of, of shovel-ready, uh, shovel-worthy projects that are out there. Um, as, as I said in the introduction, we, we did write to five federal ministers and we've done some follow-up um, in talking with staff from their departments about, about what the heritage sector can do to, to, be, to, to position itself better. Uh, we also put together a federal budget submission earlier this summer and we shared um, links I think out to you um, or to our to our members and supporters um, anyone who was willing to also submit um, to put to put that some a similar ask into the into uh, the federal budget um, decision making process uh, and so now we are I think looking forward to the speech from the throne coming up on September 23rd I believe so I'm, I might just turn it back over to Gil for his insights into where, where we are at politically at this moment and what his recommendations to the sector might be. Gil. Uh, thanks, Natalie. Uh, yeah, next, uh, I guess a week tomorrow will be the speech from the throne and uh, That'll just give a general outline of where the government uh, intends to take Canada over uh, the next uh, months. And then uh, the budget is usually the biggest thing. You know, the money is the important thing. You know, we haven't had a budget in the spring because of uh, the COVID disruption. And we don't have a budget date set. And one would assume at the latest it will be next spring. What normally happens in the fall is a kind of a, a budget, a fiscal update. And there may be, uh, we don't have a date for that, but that, that will give another signal of where the government's headed. Uh, I, I would just like to go back to the point I made earlier. There is a lot of money for infrastructure floating around, but there's also an incredible amount of debt now floating around. The government's had to spend way beyond anything that anybody pictured in the in the past. So if I were in the heritage sector, I would be moving now to find ways to access that her that uh, infrastructure money through your municipal government or through your provincial government. And uh, the other things that we should watch out for is that we're with the uh, speech from the throne, ministers are going to be getting uh, mandate letters. And that's a letter that goes from the prime minister to individual ministers saying, this is what I want you to accomplish in our, in the next year or in the next term. Um, so the speech from the throne will give a general indication. The fall budget up, uh, fiscal update will give some indication. And the, uh, <clears throat> I guess the, the outstanding question that I'm always to ask is, you know, we're in a minority government situation. Will there be an election? And I don't know. I don't think anybody knows. I'm sure nobody knows. What I would just say is don't try to anticipate whether there's going to be an election or anticipate what's going to be in the budget or what's going to be in ministers' mandates letters. Just stick to your objective. When it comes down, look at the speech from the throne look at the budget, look at the minister's mandate letters and try to, again, to leverage what's there. And what is going to be on every government's mind is jobs. There's no doubt about it. Any questions? Gil, there, there is a question about um, speaking with leaders and parties who are not currently in power. 
and the ben the benefit of that. Do you want to comment on that? Oh, very much so. The uh, the way the minority is structured right now is the government needs the support of at least one other party or it will fall and there will be an election. So the, the views of all the other parties become important. Maybe not the Green Party so much, but all the, the, the Bloc, the Conservatives and the NDP are all important right now to the government. The government will be listening to them and particularly to the NDP. <coughs> so don't, uh, and we don't know when an election will be. We don't know who will be election elected. So definitely keep in touch with other parties. It's very useful. Great. Thanks, Gil. And I think we skipped over a slide earlier on. We don't have to go back to it, but I'll ask a colleague to maybe share in the chat box the, the link to our Shovel Ready Heritage Toolkit, something that we put together with Gil's assistance earlier uh, in, I think, guess earlier this spring or summer, <clears throat> which provides resources and, and tips on how to how to get the word out, how to work with elected officials at all levels of government um, <clears throat> to, to bring att attention to your project. So I think that's a useful, um, a useful resource as well. And it, it really is about building those relationships and, uh, and keeping the communications going. We have any other questions? There is, there is a great question about someone looking for uh, a group or a professional to help evaluate the potential of a heritage property. And uh, I, we do have some resources on Regeneration Works that we can share links to um, in the chat or, or in the follow-up to this session. And it, it may also be a, a, a question of local resources, uh, maybe checking in with the Canadian Association of Heritage Professionals in your, in your part of the world. And uh, feel free to get in touch with more information uh, if we can help you by, know, by knowing more about where, you, where you're located. So I'll, we'll just keep watching those questions and uh, I, I, maybe we'll start wrapping up, but uh, I, I just really want to sincerely thank all of our panelists today. Uh, Aggie Rose Redden from PEI, Tara Lee Heslip in Saskatchewan, Gil Barrows from Vox Public Affairs and Alison Faulkner, our, our Director of uh, Philanthropy and Partnerships for the National Trust for your, for your contributions today, and, and especially for those great videos that uh, were provided in advance and that we'll share again with the recording from this session. Uh, and I'll, I'd like to thank as well my colleagues behind the scenes, Emily Boulay and Robert Peugeot, who were making it all, all work, uh, the, the, tech, the, tech, uh, the technical side of things and watching those, those questions. So maybe just in closing, I, I will um, make a, a pitch for membership in the National Trust for Canada. Uh, we, we've really enjoyed, um, despite the challenges of the pandemic, I think we, we've really um, uh, enjoyed being able to bring people together more intensively than I think we had been in the past with our regular gatherings. And uh, we're pleased to offer people participating in this session a 30% discount on membership in the National Trust. And with the 30% that you share, we would also encourage you to say, we, sh we would encourage you to consider joining your local heritage organization as well, because we're, we're really, we need to be better connected and we're really all in it together to raise the profile of the sector and make, make greater gains together. So please do consider joining and um, register for more of these sessions, uh, participate in the gatherings that we host um, here at the National Trust. So I think without further ado, I will uh, thank everyone and um, we'll, we'll respond to any questions we didn't get to uh, live, but uh, please, please dial in again and um, thank you for participating.